so welcome everyone. So I'm just briefly here to warm up the stage, basically. Most of the talk will be held by Ralph. Um, it's about building a mixed critical Linux system with the jailhouse hypervisor. So I'm here because I kind of created this hypervisor, and so I'll give you a brief introduction to what it is about, and then hold over to Ralph to show basically what he was building out of this. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, yeah. So the introduction and the current status, that's the part that I'm going to begin, and then we look into the further details. So the motivation to, to start this project is that, well, first of all, we nowadays have SMP systems all around, uh, all around the world, in embedded devices specifically as well. And that, of course, opens some chances in our domain where we used to have a lot of separate devices doing single tasks on Unicode processors. Now they can do these tasks consolidated together on a bigger machine. And many of these devices um, have Linux on it, but not all of them. And not all of our workloads are Linux-based. So there is a lot of legacy software stacks around which expect, well, single core, which expect bare metal maybe. Then there is the, the area of, of safety critical systems. We are more about, more about it later on. And yeah, there's also workload which is basically running BSP-like. So where you really want to squeeze out the last cycles of your hardware, and these days out of the multi-core high-performance processors. So this is the setup, and in order to avoid that we are running, like on the picture, Linux, uh, bare metal, blank, aside some other workload, which is technically possible, but not really cleanly isolating, uh, we created the hypervisor jailhouse, um, which is a little bit different from other hypervisors in the world out there. So first of all, it's really only about the, target uh, the static partitioning of the system. That's our main purpose. Well, we use hardware visualization for this. That's the technology. Um, but what we don't do in comparison to other hypervisors, we don't schedule. So there is no CPU core scheduling at all. And there's a one-to-one -one assignment of um, devices, of resources, to well, one user, one guest, so to say. Um, another major difference is that we are splitting up an already running Linux system. And it's shown in the graphics, basically. So we let Linux boot the system completely. Then we load the hypervisor underneath and let the hypervisor basically then split up the hardware into the pieces that we need for running additional work on it. So basically, shrink Linux and extend it for other use cases. And that all in all, it's uh, emphasizing simplicity over the features. So just a brief startup update, what we are doing, or what we are right now. So in January, we released the version 0.6. So it's not quite 1.0. There's still some bit to go. But we made major uh, steps forward already. So we merged ARM v7, uh, ARMv8 support by that time, finally, officially, contributed by Huawei nicely. Um, along this, we reworked the ARMv7 support. Um, we now have um, a nice way to communicate between the guests. Well, obviously, you need this via shared memory devices. And on top of this, we have um, virtual networks available. Um, we now also have support, well, I showed you the graphics, basically we are running something else than Linux besides Linux, but of course we can also now run Linux besides Linux. So we can partition large Linux systems into smaller, but many Linux systems. Why we see later on why this is useful. Um, yeah, and we have integrated more uh, support for interesting technology like the cache technology, cache allocation technology of Intel, which allows us to um, well, more fine-grained control which kind of uh, latencies we can get from the hardware, and more and more board support is also available these days. What's coming next? So we'll look briefly to the future. Well, we want to further advance on the shared memory device. Um, that's more a detailed technical requirement, but it will help at the end one of the final goals of Jailhouse certification. Um, Furthermore, we are participating in Google Summer of Code, most likely. Well, we have two projects running where we are hosted, co-located. One is QEMO, and the other one is LibWord. 
So there are the links to the ideas proposal up there, and we already received some feedback on students interested in these topics. <laughs> and last but not least, we are heading for safety certification of Jailhouse. Well, not of Jailhouse alone, because it's not possible. We have to certify a whole system. Um, but uh, first of all, we have to look into what is, is Jailhouse able to do this. And that looks quite good so far. Um, now the question is what the hardware can deliver to us. Because, well, we are building on hardware, so we can't really say um, the problem is solved just by solving it in Jailhouse. So we have to look at both parts, and that's actually the interesting part now. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll know more about this later on. So now I'm handing over to Ralph and his interesting activities on this. So thank you very much for the introduction. And now I'm going to explain to you how, on how we can use Jailhouse to build mixed criticality systems. So mixed criticality systems are usually systems where you run different payloads of different levels of uh, criti criticality, like critical and uncritical payloads. A typical, a typical candidate for such mixed criticality systems is a car, where, for example, um, the engine control has a higher criticality than the instrument control, for instance. And currently, those control units of those devices are, of those, um, devices are t currently located on separate physical systems. And with the use of Jailhouse, we could think of uh, consolidating them back together to one single hardware unit. So, and to demonstrate and to prove the suitability of Jailhouse for mixed criticality systems, we implemented a demonstration platform. We call it the chapter, the Jailhouse Copter, uh, which is a typical mixed criticality environment. So, uh, we have, so we have, have real-time requirements there. It is a safety critical environment because uh, the flight stack that is controlling uh, this device um, is critical for us. And we have typical uh, requirements that we have in any industrial product like reliability, um, robustness, maintainability of the whole system. Yeah, and we want to show that it is feasible with, with reasonable effort to port an existing payload application to run as a jailhouse guest. So let's have a look at the classical approach on how those technologies are implemented at the moment. So you usually have a hardware control unit um, where you typically run a minimalistic real-time operating system. So in this case, this control unit runs the NUT-X operate, real-time operating system. And on top of it, uh, there runs the Autopilot flight stack. That's an open source flight stack. And this device acquires at a high sample rate um, sensor, sensor values such as uh, sensor values from gyroscopes, compasses, accelerometers, GPS or, the remote, control, or the, re, uh, the remote controller. And it uses those values to calculate new values for, um, for, setting, for setting the motors. And this is the flight critical part of the system. And then you have the mission critical part of the system, where you, use, where you typically use um, bigger hardware, stronger hardware, um, that is able to run Linux on top of it, and then you can benefit from the whole Linux ecosystem. So you have those millions of lines of codes are here. For, for instance, you want to run an open CV application where, um, where you want to measure the landscape or where you want to follow some, uh, some waypoints. And then you use some Python application to, to, um, to process the, those data, and you, in the end, you, you present it using some web server application, for, for, for example. So we have the critical world, and we have the uncritical world. And there is some kind of communication channel between those two worlds um, to, to, um, to dump a logging data, for example, or to set new controls to, um, to the flight control. So now we want to consolidate those two worlds to isolate and separate domains running on one single hardware unit. And we do this with Jailhouse, and Jailhouse is going to ensure that those two domains are not going to, are, will not interfere in, in an unacceptable way. So in the beginning, we had to make some architectural decisions, and we chose to use an octacopter, an octa frame. Um, this is from the microcopter project. It is originally driven by an AVR, uh, by an AVR microcontroller, but as you probably know, um, they, they, an AVR is not a candidate to run Linux on top of it. 
So we dropped away the original hardware and we put our own hardware on top of it that consists of an Amlet Navio 2. So this is just a sensor board. Um, we have a GPS, we have accelerometers, we have compasses, all that we need is on top of that board. And then um, we have this, this is the core of the system. There is a NVIDIA Jetson TK1. And this one is a quad core um, ARM v7, 32 bit CPUs. It comes with two gigabytes of main memory. It's not the latest model, so it was released in the mid of two, uh, 2014. But it has a feature rich expansion header, so it exposes everything that we, that we need to the, to the outer world, such as SPI, I2C, UART, and many GPIOs. And what is important, especially for us, is that it, um, that it, that it, that it has uh, the ARM VE virtualization extensions. Um, that we need to run shellos on top of it. So it's shellos enabled, and what is pretty nice about this board that, it, that you can run it on latest uh, mainland Linux. So we want to split up our system in the following way. On the left side, you can see the critical world where we run shellos on, so, uh, so where we divide our hardware in the middle, so we assign two CPUs and all the critical devices that we need, so these are um, I, we need an I2C device for controlling the motors, the barometer, and the RC decoder. We assign an SPI device to the, to the critical cell to control the gyroscope, uh, to get uh, values from the gyroscopes, the accelerometers, GPS, and compasses. And then we assign um, the GPIO device for indicating some LEDs that indicate the current fl uh, flight status. And then on top of it, we run a preempt RT patched um, Linux kernel. And on top of that Linux kernel, as, as the user space application, we run the autopilot flight stack. Um, yeah. And the rest of the system, you can run any payload, and it is guaranteed that it will not interfere in an unacceptable way with the, other, uh, with the critical world. So our approach was as follows. We first wanted to develop the application without jailhouse uh, on bare metal. So, we did everything that you would have to do in any case. So we, um, we had to patch our kernel, so we first applied the, the preempt RT patch stack. Later, we modified Tegra device drivers to meet, uh, to meet our requirements, and then we ported uh, the autopilot flight stack. So we had to implement some motor drivers that were not supported before. Um, we had to implement uh, battery sensing because uh, our, um, our hardware was not supported um, at this point. And this is the stuff that, that you would have to do in any case. And later on, we enabled jailhouse and moved the critical software to the critical cell. And we added some uncritical payload running in, uh, in, the, rest, uh, in the rest of the system. So what was given is that jailhouse already supports to run unpatched mainline Linux on ARM. We it, it runs a preempt or t-patch kernel, as I already said, and we provide tiny tailored device trees to describe the configuration of the hardware. So if you think of a typical device tree of a platform, which is pretty huge, um, we really only, pro, uh, only pro, uh, describe the parts that we are really actually using. So we, de so we describe the CPUs, the memory regions, some devices uh, that are assigned, so that's, that's actually all uh, that we define there. The user land, so the autopilot application is provided as an initial RAM disk, so we, so we run everything in memory. We have no solid state devices there. And an intercell network driver implemented by, by Mons, I think he is here, yep. hello Mons, <laughs> um, acts as a communication ch channel between the critical and the uncritical world. So we can simply, for development, uh, this is very useful because we can simply SSH into our critical cell and uh, run our and yeah, do all our development stuff. So this was already given, and now we want to assign devices to the critical cell, and this is the, po at the part where it got interesting. So if you look at a device tree of a device, we see that it consists of some memory region, like this one here. Jailhouse already supports to remap that memory region to, the, uh, to our critical cell, and if this memory region would be aligned to the page size, then there would be, the, then there would be no need of uh, trapping, trapping the hypervisor or to, to intercept. Otherwise, we need to, otherwise, so in this case, we need to intercept because this size here is not aligned to the, to the page size. Chelos then supports to re-inject interrupts, so this device uses the shared peripheral interrupt 38, and 
we can simply uh, say if in our jailhouse cell configuration, okay, please remap this interrupt. This interrupt shall arrive in, in that cell. And with a little of overhead, um, yeah, the, the interrupt will eventually arrive in that cell. But then we have those three guys left, so clocks, resets, and DMAs. So let's talk about clocks and resets. So clocks, peripheral devices are typically driven by clocks. So device drivers typically ungate clocks if the device is not in use. This is mainly done because of uh, power saving reasons. Especially, this is especially important for battery driven environments. Um, clock drivers also support to select different speeds or baud rates of the device. And the reset lines um, help us to deassert or assert resets to, to the devices to bring them back to their initial state. So this, is what, so this is what the driver code typically looks like. So we first enable the clock, then assert and deassert the reset line, do all the driving stuff here, and later on when we are finished, we disable the clock again. So, but in, so and those clock and reset controllers are typically um, organized as memory mapped IO memory, uh, memory regions. And so this is one memory region, and every bit there um, describes the gate of a different clock. And the problem is that this memory region controls the whole platform of, uh, co uh, controls our home, whole platform. So this is really hard to partition. So in our context, we, we have real-time requirements and no low power requirements. So we first thought, okay, let's statically gate our clock before, before, we, um, before we start our cell. And we do, we do not want to dynamically change the speed or baud rate of the device, so there is actually no need for, the, for, for clocks at all. So let's just not define clocks in our, uh, in our cell, in, in, in our device tree. But it turned out that we must not ignore clocks because device drivers make the strong assumptions that clocks are always available and they are aware of the state of the clock. The same is for reset lines, so we must not ignore reset lines the driver will complain if you are if you're not providing um, the reset line. So there, there is no way out. We have to somehow para-virtualize our clock and reset controller. And we did this by uh, providing a, a jailhouse clock and reset controller to, uh, to the critical cell. And the hypervisor will trap if we access um, if we access that memory region and decide if this cell is allowed to gate or ungate the clock or not. And the same is for the Linux that was existing before. So the uncritical cell, this one will also trap so that an uncritical cell cannot ungate a clock or gate a clock of, uh, of the critical part um, and vice versa. The problem here is that we must define access bitmaps on a bit granular level. And this is really tedious and exhaustive. So we are, we are still thinking about better ways of, of how we could define that. Yeah, so now we have the clocks and resets defined in our cell. Then there's one thing missing, the DMA controllers. And again, in the context of real-time systems where latency usually matters more than high throughput, um, we just do not need DMA. Um, so our idea was, okay, so let's, let's simply um, not provide the DMA channels and try to get rid of them, but the point is here again, the drivers make the, make the assumption that the DMA channel is available even if they do not use it. So we would have to patch the driver and we didn't want to patch the driver. So fortunately, on this, on this platform, um, we were able to exclusively assign the DMA controller to our critical cell um, because there, there was no other device that was using the DMA controller in the uncritical path. Yeah, so now we have, now we, now we have a real-time operating system running inside Shalehouse. We have MMIO-based devices assigned to the critical cell. We have a virtual clock interface, and we have a Jailhouse independent executing environment. So we can run the same application inside Jailhouse that we were running before without Jailhouse. So this makes it easy for us to port existing legacy applications. Um, yeah, to, yeah. And while the, crit the uncritical cell is under full load, um, we start our platform and we are ready to fly. And I would like to show you a short video. Yeah.
Uh, let me go back to that slide. So you're talking about this one? Yeah. 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 So this is part of the critical cell. So this is, uh, this is, this is not really part of the hypervisor. That is part of, uh, we have to provide it to Linux. So before putting Linux, we have to, Linux, yeah, we have to put it to, uh, into the memory and. This belongs to the Linux with the real time patches? Yes. And you have to define the same memory regions and interrupts in our cell configuration of jailhouse. Yeah, so this is now our platform starting. And it might still look a bit clumsy, but that's not because of Chellos, it's because of my bad flying skills. That's my bad flying skills. So now we got it running, but let's talk about the, uh, about the performance of, um, of Jailhouse when running a real-time application inside it. So, we, so as I already said, we are re-injecting interrupts. So if an interrupt arrives, it first arrives in hypervisor context, and then we re-inject it um, to, our, to our cell. And we wanted to know what's the latency that is introduced by Jailhouse. So we uh, so we made a measurement and we externally toggled a GPIO, waited till the interrupt arrived, and then just toggled another GPIO and measured the, laten uh, the, uh, the latency between, uh, between those two events. So the green line here is, um, is our stimulus and the blue line is the answer. And if we are not running jailhouse and if you are running a bare metal application, which only, uh, which only task is to answer to the GPIO, uh, uh, to, to toggle the other GPIO, then we get a bare metal latency of 420 nanoseconds. And this is the bare minimum of the hardware. <laughs> so what happens if we now enable our hypervisor? Of course, we get, a, we get a performance drop, and we drop from about 440 nanoseconds to 1.2 microseconds. Yes, please? Uh, say it again. No, uh, this is really a bare metal application. So we toggle the GPIO uh, in assembler code in, uh, in the, inside the interrupt service routine. So this is, this is, this is the bare met, uh, minimum that we can, that we can get um, in, uh, on this platform. And we let the same application run inside Shellhouse, and then we get 1.2 microseconds. So Shellhouse introduces an overhead of about 800 nanoseconds on average on this platform. And on maximum, this is what counts, we get 2.8 uh, microseconds, which is fairly okay for, uh, for, for our requirements. Now it gets interesting what happens if we, uh, if we stress the other CPUs uh, in the uncritical context, because uh, the system bus of the, uh, of the system is still shared. We get a performance drop, and on average, we drop to, one point, to about 1.4 microseconds on average, and to 7.5 microseconds uh, in maximum. So this me measurement was, was done at, at a frequency of 50 hertz and for four hours. What, what were you running as a load on the other, on the other um, This was a stress test where we stressed, um, where we stressed memory, I.O., and, yeah, and CPUs. Just keeping the bus? Yeah, in. just keeping the, cup, uh, the bus on load and, and as well keeping I.O. on load. And then, as I already uh, told you, the page size is the minimum if we, if we want to do paging. So we have to dispatch if we, if we, if we, if we want to assign um, a memory region that is smaller than the page size. And then we have to, we have to, we have to trap to the, uh, to the hypervisor and decide if, um, if this guest is allowed to access uh, the memory region or not. And we made a, we made a simple measurement where we used the uh, the ARM performance monitor counter to, uh, to see 
yeah, what kind of uh, of overhead is introduced when uh, when it when it comes to uh, when we have to dispatch those pages, and without and it doesn't matter if we use chellos or not. If we assign a full page, so if we don't use subpaging, then including the measurement overhead, we have eight cycles. And now if we and if we put the rest on the load, so the system bus is shared, then we have about 217 cycles for, uh, for, for memory access. So now it gets interesting when we, when we enable subpaging, then we get a performance drop from, uh, to up to about 136 um, cycles for, for, for getting um, the, the, the response of the hypervisor and a maxi maximum of uh, about 1,000 cycles. So if we again put load on the rest on, uh, of the CPUs, then we get a then again we get a performance drop to about uh, three thousand cycles, um, which is still okay in our case. But this is a performance drop that is actually preventable if hardware vendors would place their devices on would place every device on a separate page. And this is what brings me to the next point: the requirements on hardware for yeah for hardware partitioning. So memory mapped I.O., if we look at, um, at the address space of the, uh, of the I.O. address space of our TK1, then we can see that there are several, several different I2C devices located on the same memory page. And even worse, we have different, functionali different devices of different functionalities on the same page here. So subpaging leads to performance impacts, and actually this platform has two gigabytes of uh, of, of memory, so we have two other gigabytes left for placing devices on, uh, on the, on the I.O. address space. So this would give us enough space for placing 52,000 devices if we may make, the, uh, make the pessimistic ass assumption that we need 10 pages per device. So please, it would be nice if every device would be located at a, at a, at a separate, uh, on a separate page. The next point is the clock and reset controllers. So if it is possible, it would be nice if clock and reset lines of a device would be uh, located at the device's physical memory space and not, at a con and not squashed together to one single contiguous memory region where we are controlling the whole platform. So this would really help us for partitioning the hardware. And this makes the, uh, the clock and reset controller partitionable for us. Otherwise, again, we need, we need costful um, para-virtualization. Para and direct memory access, as I already said, latency matters more than throughput. And we don't want to use DMA channels. So if you develop a device drivers, please keep in mind that someone might want to partition uh, their hardware. So please allow the absence of DMA channels if they are not really uh, necessary for the, for the driver. And again, otherwise we need costful para-virtualization. And then I stumbled uh, over, an interesting, over an interesting bug. So hardware misbehaves. When implementing, um, when implementing our platform, I, I, I realized that if you touch a, a physical I.O. memory region with its clock ungated, then the whole architecture, the whole platform will immediately, immediately freeze and stand still. No kernel panic, nothing. And I, I, I sent this, uh, this report to the Tegra mailing list, and they said, yeah, well, we are sorry, but this is the way the hardware behaves. And another developer of NVIDIA um, added, it does apply to the whole architecture pre something, so in, in, the, in, the, in the latest version it got fixed, but this bug is known. And we need to be aware of that because when someone ungates a clock, we need to hide um, the physical memory pages from that, from that guest so that we can prevent that the whole architecture will, uh, will stand still because an uncritical cell must not, influ uh, must not influence a critical one. And this brings me to the conclusion, in future, we have to take more attention on uh, on hardware software co-design. So in the end of the day, it's the hardware where our software runs on, and it's the software that runs on the hardware. And every work and every software-based uh, software workaround leads to, <laughs> leads to latency impacts, leads to more overhead. 
but still we were able to show a solid testament for implementing real-time safety critical mixed criticality applications with the JLOS hypervisor. So thank you very much. And, <laughs> and if you have any questions, do not hesitate to question me now. Yes, please. It supports arbitrary partitioning, but you have to assign at least one CPU to a cell. So the minimum configuration of a cell is you have one CPU and the region of memory. That's the bare minimum. And what about the distribution of criticality? Did you have two criticals and one uncritical? Sure. Uh, yeah, yes, sure. Yes. So well, there's no limitation. There is no, uh, at least a cell. Under, under ideal conditions, there is no influence between, uh, between those cells. So you can actually run any criticality on top of it. Yes. Yep. Of, uh, of IO. So there is influence. There is influence, so but how, how do you have uh, deterministic behavior if you have variability due to a non-critical load? Uh, well, you have deadlines, and if you know that you can meet, uh, and if you know that you can meet those deadlines, that's 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 okay. Yeah. So and yes, there there is uh, there is some overhead, but if you know that if if you can keep it as minimal as possible. And if we can keep it deterministically minimal. So, so in terms of the, the uh, uh, kind of low level CPU uh, memory issues, is that at the cache level in terms uh, of, of the system? Or are you talking about, I mean, because you can easily partition internal memory to each CPU um, in terms, of, uh, in terms of, of memory so that there is no crossover between two, two instances of Linux, but still shared, shared bus. Yeah, okay. yeah, so the, the question is where the influences, uh, the interference come from. Yeah, so caches is one reason, and I mentioned before on, on Intel, for example, we have now the cache partitioning mechanism in hardware available that probably will spread to other architectures as well in the future. Um, that's one, one reason, but there, of course, there is more going on inside the hardware. Some of them you see on the on the diagrams as, as blocks and okay, understandable, but there are also channels that you don't see because they are well hidden behind and maybe not documented. Um, this is very important, as what I said before, if you really want to go for a critical system certified for a certain functionality, for certain behavior, you have to include this kind of channels in your, in your consideration as well. Either you have to argue, okay, they, there is influence, but there's always influence, but it doesn't matter because the deadline is still fulfilled, even if that influence is maximum exposed. Uh, but you have to know this. You have to detect it either if something goes completely wrong or you have to argue, okay, we know because of the architecture this can't happen. Right. That's basically the whole story. So you can't really do this in software. You have to do it uh, co-designed with the hardware um, for this kind of, of scenarios. But yeah, or okay. Not deal with power right now. It's okay. Yeah, we we saw one case today. That's about the clocks and the and the gates uh, of this in the red Z lines, where well, basically you have one one resource controlling the whole platform or at least multiple devices. You mentioned another case, power control. So you even you have this already on on the core level on on some devices on some architectures that when if you go down with the, the power level of one core, the other one may also go down or at least have a higher latency. So you have these kind of interference channels. Um, you have to identify them. Um, well, if the hardware is not capable of, of, of uh, allowing some kind of control, then you may have lost. There is no general answer to this, um, except that you have to look at in the individual cases. This is more of a question. So power, sure, but if, if one can't shut down because one needs power, then you'd assume it would, it would still contain a high power. But I'm hmm? asking specifically in the case of like an ITC peripheral, where you can have one master, not multi-master. Okay, oh yeah, yeah. Shit. 
So this is the kind of scenario of a shared bus. So you have multiple devices on a bus, and, and uh, only one host uh, could control it. There, there are always cases which, where, where the, this uh, static partitioning doesn't work. Well, you can always fall back to do something in software, split up this kind of interrelationship in software, um, but this is not our first step. Okay. It's the last resort on a platform, which is otherwise nice, but maybe has some shortcoming in this regard. Then you may consider a software solution. But this is always a trade of basically um, how much effort you spend on the software and how much effort this costs you basically for, for certain certification as, uh, efforts or uh, simply of maintenance efforts, yeah. So, sorry, uh, can, you, can you clarify then the hypervisor that you guys are, have, what aspect does it actually control um, in terms of this resource? I mean, in a traditional server kind of system, yeah. the hypervisor is responsible for the... The whole hardware. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is not the model we have here. Uh, wherever possible, we hand out the hardware directly to the guests. So the hypervisor is in charge of uh, controlling the CPUs with respect to this privileges that you need to give to the guest or not give to them. Um, it's in charge of, of um, certain interrupt aspects because interrupts usually, well, in some cases you can uh, route them directly, but in many cases today, you basically are in charge as a hypervisor of, of redirecting them, um, and that's another task for the uh, hardware, uh, for the hypervisor. Um, the page tables you have, so the memory accesses that the guests issue, and also the, the memory accesses, the DMA accesses, the devices issue, um, these are also controlled by the hypervisors. In this particular case, the TK1, we don't have the SMMU implemented yet, but it would be possible. We have it on x86 running, um, so this is another task for the hypervisor. And then there are some minor details, I would say, <laughs> the specialties of your architect, the specialties of your board, where you have to add something. Uh, but in general, we want to keep it very simple. So this is the, the, major, the, 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 the major aspects I mentioned already, and these are really even cross-architecture. So the concepts apply across architectures. It doesn't make the code generic, but at least the concepts. I'm okay, pretty. You showed yep. us wrong, right? The, the use case is pretty like strict, but we are talking about the same thing. Yeah. Well, well, this is not rocket science, and so oh, to say. Okay. Well, there are some some minor details which are new, like but open, so, okay. yeah. Green Hill hypervisor. Uh, right? You mentioned one, and um, there are dozens out there, implementing this on on ARM, implemented on x86, maybe on both, no, maybe I'm on something. Yeah, yeah, even on embedded. You have dozens of them. So I heard the stories from automotive hypervisors. There are many of them. And they have all their pros and cons, but there are not that many if you talk about the open source market, for example. There are not that many with this small code base. So in case of and ARM, I think we have some seven or 8,000 lines of code for this architecture to implement this logic um, right now. It's not complete, but pretty close. On x 6 the same situation, basically. And as far as I know, all of the commercial ones do scheduling. And we do no yeah. scheduling at all. Most of them, yeah. So this is really, it's really for this specific purpose designed, and we don't want to go beyond that. <laughs> so there are other solutions which can do more, and which are already existing, so that's not our goal. Yes, both. Uh, yes, of course. So, because we do not want that uh, the critical cell can can in, uh, can somehow interfere with the uncritical one, and vice versa. So, we do not want the uncritical one to interfere with uh, with the critical yeah, one. So the, the question was if you if everyone is inter if it's intercepting every memory access on a on a shared page on both on both cells. Just to repeat it for the recording. Yeah. Yep. So Correct. Would it be okay to not cramp the critical uh, cell? 
So, the, uh, uh, so the question was, uh, what happens if the critical cell accesses somewhat outside its scope, or? You assume that it will not access. Well, if no, you. No. We, we don't assume this. We can actually enforce this. So because we can apply the same uh, enforcement on the, on the containment, on the, on the memory access, on, on the CPU access, whatever you, uh, resources you hand out on the critical as well as on the critical cell. So there's no privilege right now in this regard for the, for the critical cells. There are other privileges, but this is not in the scope. Because there are also scenarios where you think about you have two critical cells basically monitoring themselves. And if you now start basically dropping the access control for these cells, you can't no longer argue that these two, um, each other monitoring cells are independent of each other. They can actually override each other, and then you basically lost your argument. So critical does not indicate that it's trusted? Not trusted, no, no. At least from the hypervisor point yep. of view. So I didn't get the last one. Okay, yeah. So the question is, what what mechanisms we do apply on the on the shared memory communication channel to ensure the isolation? So so right now the the model which is in, in the release, um, the O.6 release, is basically a symmetrical read-write memory region. So both sides see the same memory region physically and can interfere with each other happily on this memory region. Um, that's the current model implemented, but we also have a staging tree where we implement two independent channels, uh, which, is, which are unidirectional. So one side can read write on the channel, the other side can only read from it. Um, that makes, of course, argumentation of a protocol built on top a bit easier, that they are not really interfering with each other. Of course, it is an interference channel, logically, um, but you have, to, you have to apply certain additional measures on the software being built on top that they don't um, well, violate the protocol you want to implement on top. So that's the basic model. What, what Mons was now implementing on top of this device is basically a Linux driver um, doing a, a virtual network device on both ends. And that's what we are exploiting here. Um, that works both for this uh, unitary, uh, for the multidirectional channel as well as the unidirectional channel. But you have, the same, you have the same problem if you, have an, if you have an architecture where you have separate devices. So even then there is some communication channel between those two devices and yeah, you have to be aware of that. So the, the question is how to, to port it on a different architecture. So yeah, well, so if you look at the readme, we have some some architectural requirements on the target platform. So we we require, for example, on ARM the virtualization extensions, on Intel VTX and VTD, on AMD the corresponding features. That's basically the, the fundamental requirement. So currently we are on the x86 and on the ARM world with with the supporting. So if you go for a different SOC or a different board. Um, these days, on ARM at least, it's, it's pretty simple um, that you, well, by basically, um, on ARM B8, for example, um, you just have to describe the hardware. And if you're unlucky, you maybe also have to implement, for debugging purposes, mostly a, a, um, a driver for the UART, so the con console of the hypervisor is dumped um, on, on a physical device, and you see basically what's happening if something is not working initially, and it's a normal case. that you bring up is not smooth, and you have to tune a little bit. Uh, but then the dependency is very, very minimal. So they are currently, well, at this stage right now, uh, no further hardware dependencies. So basically, you are for debugging, but everything else is handled as such. So you don't have to re-implement drivers for... No. Yeah, we, do, we, don't have a, we don't have drivers currently, except for the, the, the console drivers at this moment, because we didn't solve properly the, the, the clock topic yet, which may lead to drivers or may lead, if you're lucky, to a more uh, generic pattern, uh, access control pattern, but there might be some need. So on, on x86, for example, we have a driver, so to say, for the interrupt controller. It, it interprets basically the access and, and then decides if an access is allowed or not allowed.
uh, yeah. Some memory configuration, some like, really. No, we, we don't expect um, too much from the pre-configuration of the hardware. We just expect that the current user of the hardware, Linux, is not further configuring it. So basically, we take over control in the hypervisor of the hardware, we freeze the state. Um, and we only interfere or in, in control the accesses which we really need to have or keep dynamic during runtime. So there is no further assumption, basically, on this. But of course, if we look for the details later on, I suppose there will be further checks required and further, well, validation needed of the platform state before really declaring it to be safely partitioned. Okay. That's, that's work in progress, and that depends, of course, also on the information that we just are starting to collect from the hardware vendors on this regard. Okay. No further questions? Then, thank you. Thank you.